Just over a month ago, I took ownership of this. This is Hema, my Vectrex VX1. It's an electric maxi scooter that was made in 2007. It's powered by nickel metal hydride battery packs. And if you are a regular to the channel, you will see that I have made several videos in the last couple of weeks discussing some of the things that we've done. I have done a basic service. I've basically bled the brakes, moved the brake cables around. I have replaced the gearbox oil. And uh, most importantly, I have replaced the tires, which were from 2007. So a 16 year old tires on a motorbike, which is not good. Today though, today I have a bit of a dilemma and I'm not talking about the fact that I'm sat here outside while my glasses are fogging up. Look, let's go for a ride and I'll tell you more. As regulars to the channel will know, I purchased Hemba for $800 from someone in Seattle. Uh, and interestingly enough, the person that sold the Vectrex VX1 to the person I purchased it from, so the previous seller, reached out in the comment section and said, hey, I think this is a bike that I used to own and I was the person who switched the brake levers around. As you might remember from a previous video, the front and rear brakes were switched around because the previous owner, plus one, uh, decided that it was an easier way to control Hemmer's regenerative braking, which on a VX1, you basically, I can show you now, you basically roll the throttle forwards. And that was well timed because someone is walking alongside the road and I didn't want to scare them by being super quick. So anyway, uh, that owner told me that he used to own multiple Vectrexes. Um, I think he had three and he commuted to and from Microsoft on them. At some point, obviously, he decided he was going to sell them and he sold the VX1 that I now own to the guy that I purchased it from. And interestingly, he said at the time he uh, warned the other person that uh, the brakes had been switched around so the front and the rear brakes were the opposite to what they'd normally be on a motorbike and that owner apparently said yep okay but didn't tell me when they sold it to me which is why I was surprised by that particular piece of news. Anyway in the time since the last video I have ridden Hema a, a fair few times. I being on two wheels is is like therapy for me and I really like riding and so I have tried to take Hemmer out as much as possible. The weather has been absolutely diabolical here of late and obviously with all the leaves on the road as well I haven't been able to ride as fast as I would like because I like staying on the bike. We interrupt your viewing pleasure to bring you a little PSA. I talk in this video about coming off and that's exactly what I did yesterday, the day before this video is uploaded. I'm fine. I overcooked a corner, went into some soft mud and Hammer and I parted company. I haven't broken anything. My bike is okay. Uh, the only thing that's hurt is a little bit of pride and I have some soft tissue bruising. But the point of this is, if you are a motorcyclist, always wear all your gear, all the time. Be an at-gat rider, because that's why I walked away. Back to me from the past. So anyway, after fixing the brakes and after putting the tyres on and doing the gearbox, I have been able to ride a fair bit with Hema and get to know Hema a little bit better. It's a little slippery there. And I've been really impressed, you know, aside from some issues with the bike not wanting to charge when it's wet, which it's been a lot lately, uh, the bike has actually behaved itself pretty impeccably. Um, I'm getting between 20 and 30 miles of range. The real end of that, the, the kind of the safe end of that is about 20 miles because I live up a, a mountain or a mini mountain and going any more than that is, is dangerous uh, because it means that I risk uh, losing my ability to get back up the mountain. And that's not necessarily a good thing. 
but since getting Hammer, I have been introduced to a wonderful WhatsApp community, and I don't normally use WhatsApp, so I've been like learning how to use a WhatsApp. It's been interesting. And I've been learning a lot about the VX1. As it turns out, and I kind of had a, an inkling of this when I, when I decided I was going to buy this, the VX1 I think is probably the most well-supported classic electric motorbike out there today. There are people who are really, really just developing incredible things for it. The original VX1 stopped production, it was like 2013, something like that, uh, but it carried on production in Poland for a while, and there is an incredibly large and active group of people in Spain who are working really hard to keep these bikes on the road, to keep them supported, and to make sure that you can continue to ride them. And unlike a lot of other electric motorcycles out there, like uh, the Zero motorcycles, Vectrex is, is pretty open. Um, and that's partly because it's a lot older. And it's partly because, you know, after the company went bust, I think a lot of the people who were working for it were like, I really like this bike. I want to see it continue to, to exist and continue to be on the road. And so they worked really hard to make sure that that they could continue to support it and I think that is I think one of the things that means that that this bike is going to be uh, continue to be well supported as time goes on. I wanted to say that I find that the community uh, surrounding the VX1 is really incredible and they're very kind they kind of are patient with newcomers which is really nice a lot of the times kind of very nerdy groups like that are not always um they're not always the most welcoming of strangers but they've they've welcomed me into their ranks there are a lot of people who know a lot of stuff and i've learned some really interesting things and that's why i'm making this video that's why i need your help so the first thing i need to do with emma is to upgrade the onboard charger because apparently the onboard charger I have is kind of the, the weakest of the onboard chargers and the most unreliable. It's the most likely to go wrong. And if I'm going to be upgrading this spike to lithium iron, which I definitely need in order to get more than 20 real world usable miles out of it, I need a, a new uh, a charger. And I found the guy that I need to buy that charger from and that's cool. I think it's probably going to be like seven, eight hundred dollars shipped to the US and it will come with all of the right bits I need to interface with the VX1's hardware, which is lovely. Um, there are special charger profiles that you can load onto it, I believe. It's CAN bus enabled, so it will work with all the CAN bus stuff. Why are you walking across the road? Anyway, all of that is great and that's the first step. But then the second step is choosing choosing a battery pack. So originally uh, the plan was to put Nissan Leaf battery cells in this bike. Uh, the original Nissan Leaf uh, 24 kilowatt hour uh, battery pack can be split up and you can put I think 19 Nissan Leaf modules in the space down here in between my legs and that will mean that I would get about a, a usable eight to nine kilowatt hour battery pack. Now the original battery pack in this is like three and a bit. It's tiny. Now it's probably closer to two and a bit. It's even smaller because it's older and it doesn't work, you know, fantastically well. So what I need to decide is if I am going to get a Nissan Leaf battery pack, I have a source for Leaf modules. Um, there's a local garage in Portland, Oregon that does battery upgrades for Nissan Leafs and they've said that there are some cells I can buy from them that have a, about a 70% 70% state of health so that means they have about 70% of their original capacity left and that would be usable and that would probably give me somewhere between you know 60 and 90 miles of real world range 
and that would be the most affordable. Um, I'd be looking at somewhere in the region of about about twelve hundred to fifteen hundred dollars for that, and that would give me a really usable bike. You know, uh, the round trip to M's, uh, M's our DP. In case you don't know. Uh, the round trip to their house is about 75 miles so if i could do that on hema i would be incredibly happy because that is a trip that i want to be able to regularly make on the bike the challenge is obviously that would be at highway speeds on the freeway flat out at 65 70 miles an hour or 55 in oregon the speed limit most of the speed limits are 55 but when you get into washington it gets a bit faster and i could very easily uh, I could very easily get that battery and put it in and get it to work. But I found out, thanks to membership of this incredible group, that you can also put in Volkswagen ID3 battery modules. And apparently they are some of the most energy dense battery modules that you can get your hands on easily in the used battery market. and instead of going from like three and a bit or as i said earlier two and a bit kilowatt hours of usable battery capacity instead of going into between six and nine kilowatt hours depending on the health of the leaf modules i ended up with i would be getting somewhere in the region of 15 maybe even 20 kilowatt hours i know some of the guys who are on the forum for the vectrex vx1 have said that it's possible they think to squeeze closer to uh, 20 kilowatt hours into the space uh, where the original batteries go but that apparently comes with some some issues because it's a higher voltage so I would probably be looking at like 15 or 16 kilowatt hours now 15 16 kilowatt hours on this bike would probably give me real world range of up to 150 miles per charge and I'm kind of excited about that. I'm thinking that honestly, that might be a fun thing to do. But the reason I'm mentioning this to you all is I want your input. Now, obviously the cost to put Volkswagen ID3 batteries in is gonna be a lot more. At the moment, the modules that are used in the ID3 are not readily available in the US. Basically, although they're the same battery cells, they're arranged differently for different capacity battery packs. So the battery packs that I would want to install are somewhere around, uh, I think they would come from the, it's either the 60 or the 70, uh, sorry, the 50 or the 60 kilowatt hour battery pack. Uh, the 82 kilowatt hour battery packs that you find in the North American ID4s are actually the same cells but the modules are arranged differently so instead of the 12 series 2 parallel arrangement that I would need to put in this um, bike the ones in North America are 8 series 3 parallel so it's the same capacity right it's the same number of cells the same capacity the problem is that I would have to rewire those Sorry, I need to open my, my visor so I don't um, overheat or, or get super, super um, fogged up. The problem with that, of course, is that then I would have to break into the modules and rewire them. Apparently it's possible, but it's very, very difficult. Um, at some point in the future, Volkswagen is going to make those smaller battery packs for entry-level ID4s in North America, but as I understand it, they haven't done that yet. Uh, the cell chemistry is slightly different and I think the way the packs are, are actually built is slightly different. So I would be kind of going into unknown territory a bit to get the higher capacity battery pack. So what do you think I should do? Do you think I should go, okay, I'm just going to use the original Nissan Leaf batteries that I said I was going to use. Maybe see if I can get a, a, a battery modules from the latest generation Leafs, which would have more capacity and more range. Do I use those batteries that have like a 70% state of health and may not have, you know, ultimately the range that I want to get from this bike, but we'd be able to do it cheaply and we'd be able to actually get some video content out to you 
a little bit more quickly? Or do you want me to wait, use this as it currently is, warts and all, it sometimes does throw occasionally error lights, which are related to the thermistors uh, getting too moist when it rains heavily. Um, I can cope with that, right? I have another vehicle that I can use, that I can ride when I need to. But I, I honestly don't know what I should do. So tell me in the comments below, what would you do if you were in my situation? Would you would you save up and buy like a three, four thousand dollar battery pack for this eight hundred dollar scooter so you could do you know, hundred and fifty plus miles on it? Or would you go the route of saying, okay, you know, you have a um, you have a, a, a bike that goes further than it originally could and that's fine and, and you should just be happy with that. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below because I would I would love to come up with a solution that works for me but also a solution that that brings you guys some fun on the channel because at the end of the day while this is my personal project vehicle and I do want to ride it as much as possible so I don't have to drive my F-150 Lightning everywhere. I would also like your input because I think that that really makes a big difference to uh, how, how you enjoy the content. I think you guys should have a say in how it's made. Anyway, sorry this is slightly rambly. I have been trying to stay safe on the road. Um, this is a proof that this does go up to uh, 60 miles an hour because I've been riding it a little bit slower because I have my summer gloves on. I picked my summer gloves instead of my winter gloves and I'm really cold. Uh, it's currently flat out at about 65 miles an hour, but I am going to slow down because just up here they have been doing burnouts in the road and that changes the, uh, the quality of the road surface and I really do not want to slip inside. I know that when they've got extra rubber on the road it can sometimes make the grip different so we like to make sure that we can get through that nice and cleanly without sudden changes in grip and without suddenly going sideways. So anyway, I'm going to hand back to me for the closeout credits and uh, I'll give you another Vectrex update very soon. Thanks for joining me today and if you've got any thoughts make sure you leave them below in our discord chat room or you can reach out to us on Mastodon. Thanks to the amazing list of people scrolling by on your screen right now. They are some of the more than 1500 people who help fund this channel through Patreon and YouTube, helping us cover our bills, pay our team and making sure that we can remain 100% independent. If you'd like to join them and see your name listed below, just follow the links. There are a range of different tiers you can sign up for from as little as $1 a month, or if you pay yearly, just about $10.08 a year. A huge welcome to our newest supporters, Conrad Young, Neon Frog, Siobhan Greeny, Alan Savage, Scotty, Ray Mario, Jennifer, Nesklova, and the Lord of Chaos. Thanks for becoming part of the TE crew. If you'd like to support us with a one-off donation, you'll find links below to make Kofi and Bitcoin donations, and we even have an old-fashioned PO box you can reach us at. The address is also linked below. And if you're in need of some swag, you'll find our swag store also in the down below. We've got some great content coming up, so make sure you're subscribed